Hey, good morning, everyone. What a great start to our morning. My name is Ben Lanius. I'm the CEO of High Point Global. We're the citizen experience company, and this is a topic, uh, of course, very close to us and uh, very excited to see this much passion in the room about the topic today. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of introducing our first panel, What Drives the Need for an Omnichannel Experience? Of course, today, citizens uh, expect the same level of service uh, regardless of the channel that they use. Our panel will discuss the challenges of the government delivering an omni-channel experience and explore the needs to drive that experience. Uh, please join me in welcoming our moderator uh, today, Katherine Kravnichok. Katherine recently left the General Services Administration where she managed cloud technologies and platforms that enabled GSA's business lines to operate more efficiently while enhancing engagement with GSA's agency customers and citizens. Catherine just recently joined the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, where she is standing up the new Enterprise Platforms Division, also focused on delivering technology solutions for better engagement with consumers, financial institutions, and other regulators. Please join me in welcoming Catherine and the panel this morning. Thank you, Ben. Um, and thank you all for joining us for our first panel. What drives the need for omni-channel experience? Uh, as Ben said, my name is Katherine Kravchanik. I am so uh, um, at CFPB. We engage with thousands of consumers every single day, helping them answer their questions and taking their complaints. Um, so, I think today, throughout this entire uh, conference, we'll hear a lot about how, in the commercial space, the single seamless experience across every single channel is no longer uh, a strategic competitive advantage, but it's absolutely table stakes. So as a, a customer, you expect this kind of experience from any one of your favorite retailers, but would you expect it from one of the federal agencies or one of your state and local agencies? Um, and as a taxpayer and a consumer, I would say the answer is yes. So what are government agencies doing today to provide that same level of customer engagement that we see in the private sector space? So we're gonna talk a little bit about that with our panel over the next 40 minutes or so. So today we've got a panel where we're gonna have a great conversation um, with some of the leading innovators in the government customer experience space. They're gonna share with us more about their customer engagement programs, um, some of the challenges that they've experienced, and then a lot of the successes that they have experienced as they've started to stand up and manage their omni-channel um, engagement platforms, serving the citizens that they engage with. So without further ado, I will do a quick introduction. So first we've got Kate, Kate Hammond. Kate is the Customer Connect program manager at the uh, Social Security Administration. Kate has um, more than 15 years of experience in programs and systems at SSA. Next, we've got Josh Peck. Josh is a senior advisor with the Office of Communications, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Josh leads outreach and retention with the um, healthcare insurance uh, marketplace. Josh is an expert using emerging technologies to help facilitate um, the uh, mass participation and issue advocacy and civic engagement. And then finally, last but not least, we've got Tony Sadek. He's the former chief performance officer for the government of the District of Columbia, uh, working in the office of the mayor. Tony actually just um, left and joined Encapsulate as a senior consultant. Tony is an expert in performance management and specializes in uh, data-driven approaches for addressing perfor improving performance in public entities and has hands-on experience with perform the performance stat model, uh, data analytics, and strategic planning. So thank you to our panelists for being here. Yeah. Um, so why don't we kick it off? I would love for the panelists to maybe share a little bit with the audience about your background, your role, some of the work that you're doing today. So why don't we start with Kate? Sure, thanks. Can everybody hear me okay? As long as I don't hit this, obviously. Um, I'm a product manager for the Social Security Administration, and um, this relates to a project and a new initiative called Customer Connect. Um, what's really exciting about this is that we really are looking at what the customer's wants and needs are. Some of the things that Amtrak was talking about earlier is exactly, like, I think she stole my, like, all my notes here. Um, because those, those are the same words that we're using. 
Um, back in the fall, uh, I was part of a smaller staff work group, and we were given the space to think outside the box. We also talked about what we currently do, what are our current issues at our agency in, in terms of our as-is processes. And then we started looking forward to the future and thinking about what do we want to be like in the year 2020. So we talked about our 2B processes and that kind of thing. So while I was in that work group, there were two um, major things that we used to help us identify what it looked like in the future as well as what it looks like for us now. And Rob Klopp will be presenting uh, earlier a little bit later this afternoon and one of the things that he'll show you is the framework that we used as well as the life events. So in our work group, in our small staff work group, we called our customer Chris. Um, and Chris could be male, female, whichever you decide. And it was easier for us to kind of identify with Chris and talk about Chris in that fashion. The thing that was really moving for us within just, you know, the employees in the, in the Social Security Administration that were part of this work group was realizing at some point we had this aha moment where we said, we are Chris. Our parents are Chris. You're all Chris. So it was, it was really interesting to be part of that group and see where it was going. One of the things that Amtrak talked about, too, was anticipating customers' needs. And so I'm going to read real quickly what we came up with in the work group, and it was see me, recognize me, know me, anticipate me. So it's coming to the customer on their terms and understanding exactly what they need. And so it was really interesting to look forward to the future as well as trying to identify some of the current issues that we had. So as a product manager, I'm excited to kind of take those ideas and, and incorporate them into all channels and all omni channels in our agency as well as all different facets um, from our experience with the customer, but also for our employees' experience. All right, you want to go ahead, Josh? Okay. So, uh, I work on uh, outreach and retention at healthcare.gov, um, a, a site you may have heard of. Um, <laughs> it's a it's a really exciting uh, uh, project to be working on because uh, it's it's so new and it's got we have so much uh, internal focus on it that it allows us to do things that I think we're, we're, we aren't typically able to do in the federal government. Um, and it also has a, a whole bunch of, of challenges and hurdles that we, you know, we face every day in, in um, creating the, the consumer experience that, that we all want to create. Um, I have been there for a year and a half. Um, before working at healthcare.gov, I worked um, primarily in the nonprofit space. Um, I worked at Organizing for America when the uh, Affordable Care Act was passed. Um, and I've worked at nonprofits like the One Campaign, um, sort of helping uh, with uh, member relations. Um, what's been exciting for me working at healthcare.gov is uh, really being there during the, the time where we really stood up our omnichannel experience. Um, and that's something that, uh, has, is some, that, that I think may uh, be helpful in, in how you think about creating your omnichannel experience or improving the experience that you have because the, the process that we went through, uh, we went through very quickly um, and uh, we still have lots, uh, lots of things that we're hoping to do but um, we've come a long way in a, in a very short period of time. So I, I just sort of want to give you a sense of the, the, the couple of things that we um, are really focused on. So one is, is we, f we focus on bringing uh, new people into the marketplace to increase enrollment. Um, and you know, to do that, we, uh, last year we were looking, there were 10.5 million eligible uninsured people um, in the United States. Uh, so reaching those people bringing them into the marketplace, bringing them through that process, making sure they had a, a great experience, found something that was affordable and, and provided the, the quality care that they were looking for. That was sort of, that's one part of, of our, our work. Um, but the second part, and, and arguably the third, uh, is, is taking our current consumers, um, making sure that they're happy, uh, making sure that they stay with us year to year, and many of them, just because of natural life events, will leave us and come back. Um, so it's bringing those, those past customers back to us. Um, so those three things are, are sort of uh, all pieces of a puzzle for how we want consumers to interact with us. Um, and you know, there, there are, those pieces of the puzzle all have one giant overlay, which is how we bring them to us and then how we walk them through the, the process itself. And I'm excited to share with you some of the things that we've learned and, and how to do that today and some of the challenges we've had. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tony. Uh, I am a little bit of an odd duck here, the uh, state and local guy in a room full of feds. Um, but I'm really excited to be here and I think actually that uh, there's a lot of exciting things happening at the state and local level. There's a lot 
uh, fewer barriers, I think, that we face to, to experimentation. And sometimes we succeed, sometimes we fail. But uh, I'd encourage you all to keep your eye on it. I'm a senior uh, consultant at Encapsulate. I joined Encapsulate recently. Prior to that, I was the chief performance officer uh, for uh, the District of Columbia under the new mayor, Muriel Bowser. I helped her stand up her performance uh, program. And you know, as we've been sort of saying here, the drumbeat is that uh, the, the, the bar has been raised for uh, what a customer experience is uh, and, and, and government's being held accountable for that. And that's true across all citizens. And uh, in DC, at least, that includes one very prominent citizen, which was the new mayor. You know, when she comes in, uh, she had that, ex that expectation for DC government. And you know, one thing that I sort of uh, want to flag and sort of note is that when we talk about uh, uh, omni-channel experience, uh, often we're framing it within the context of our agency. Um, when the mayor comes in, she looks across 75 district agencies and says, I want an omni-channel experience as though we are one entity. Uh, so I don't want you creating your omni-channel experience and you creating yours. They need to be linked. Um, so it can be, she came in and then there was this sort of, it was by turns perplexing and frustrating that you could report your bulk trash pickup to three different places and you could either receive very fast service or no service at all. Um, and they could be uh, deaf and blind to each other. Um, and so we really, uh, she turned to the chief performance officer, among others, to say, what's going on here? Uh, why, why do we have these disparities across the city and what can we do to uh, make a more uniform experience? Uh, so that's what I'm here to talk about. I'm really excited to talk about it. We did some interesting things with uh, 311 um, and uh, I think that was just the start. Thanks, Tony. So I heard a lot about coming to the customer on their terms, outreach, meeting expectations, linking that omni-channel experience. Maybe you guys could talk a little bit about the strategies that work. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about some of the hurdles and some of the successes that you've experienced as you've gone through this journey toward an omni-channel platform and service delivery. Okay. Do you want to start, Kate? Sure. Um, we don't have any hurdles. Okay, <laughs> of course. So we're perfect. <laughs> Um, actually, one of the biggest things for our agency was to get stakeholder buy-in. As Herb pointed out before, we have so many employees, we have thousands of offices, so to start to get people to think about the customer is a challenge in itself. Um, we're not there yet, it's all transformational at this point, but we hope to get there. Also, um, it's just getting everybody to start thinking about the customer and getting in the right mindset. Amtrak talked a little bit earlier about the culture, and it is. It starts at the top, and it goes all the way down to the person that interacts with you when you come in for retirement. So one of the things that we also talked about earlier was the fact that while we think we're the only game in town, because we're the Social Security Administration, what it really means, though, is the fact that the customers are looking at Amazon. They are looking at Apple. You know, Amazon knows me so well that they know when I need my K-Cups before I even know that I need them. <laughs> it's in my email, they tell me, and I look in, in the drawer and they're all gone. And I'm like, <laughs> they know me, right? That's the experience that they want. And I think shifting towards that is a huge hurdle for everyone. It's not about just how I do my job and what I've done in the past. So we have customers that are very confused by our programs and what they're entitled to. And so we talk in terms of, oh, you're, you're entitled to Title II benefits, Title 16 benefits, and it's very confusing for them. So it, again, it's coming to them on their terms and starting to talk so that they understand us a little bit better. In terms of strategies for that work group that I was talking about earlier, our Customer Connect work group, we're looking at trying to build an infrastructure that's flexible enough to meet future needs. Let's say that we can get data from a different source going forward. We want to make sure that we're able to bring that information in and that, that's something that we can use to understand what the customer wants and what they need. We also, um, one of the things that we did was we brought in uh, a futurist and we talked about all different kinds of things. And, and we had robots, we had all kinds of crazy things that came in. And um, one of the things that I really thought was a takeaway for us is that data is the new gold. And I think that going forward, would you keep that in mind? That data is, it's customer data. It's knowing their preferences. It's knowing what they want. It's knowing where they want to be and before they even know it. So that's something that we're looking at is to build the infrastructure so that we can adapt to whatever data we want to bring in. 
And it's also expanding on the uh, My Social Security profile that all of you in the room have signed up for. Um, and so we, we're looking forward to expanding that and making it more customizable and user friendly. Um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting is I started telling people what I was working on. I was a product manager. One, no one knew what that was in our agency. And two, people started saying, oh yeah, I wrote this paper uh, four years ago that said X, Y, and Z. Would you like to see it? Oh, I wrote this. I'm like, yes, I would love to see it. I'll take it home tonight and read it by my bedside. But really, the interesting part was it's people from all facets of the agency. It's in systems. It's in operations. They're excited about this. They want this. They know that the customers need that. And I think that that is one of the biggest successes is knowing that your employees even want that. So that's, that's kind of the strategies and hurdles and things that we're looking at. All right, so hashtag data is the new gold. Yes. <laughs> like it? All right, yeah. Josh. You want to so so I, I just uh, building on that, I think um, one of the biggest hurdles is having um, a clear goal or, or sort of a clear uh, measure of success. And I think that's why data is the new gold. But there's also a lot of data, so I think getting um, getting a team aligned about what it is you're trying to do is I, I've found to be one of the, the bigger challenges um, uh, just in general. I, I think there are, there are tons of hurdles. I mean, I think having, um, the, you know, from people, from process, uh, privacy, um, having the, the infrastructure in place, uh, having the, the, you know, the, the money to, to, to support what you're doing, the, the, the hurdles are, are, you know, are everywhere. I think what I would sort of say, I think some of our successes um, sort of stem with how to tackle some of those hurdles. Um, you know, one, start off with a clear measure of, of success. I think two is get your, your key channels in place. Um, this, this may sound silly, but you, you can't really have an omnichannel experience until you have, um, you know, multiple channels to be able to, to do it. Multiple channels doesn't mean all channels are not created equal. Some are really useful, some are uh, a total waste of time. Um, and being able to figure out how you measure success is this really Im important um, precursor to figuring out where to invest, you know, which channels to invest in. Um, the third is probably um, figuring out what those customer journeys are. Um, so, you know, some customers are going to be more likely to use uh, a specific channel or multiple channels or sp some channels in tandem. Um, so once you better understand sort of how your customers are traveling through um, the experience that you've laid out, that's when you can start to really make the improvements that matter um, with the, the limited resources, the, all of those limited, all those hurdles make it difficult to do everything at once. So it's, it's about being really strategic and picking those, those very few things you can do to, to make a big difference. Um, and then I think, um, you know, ultimately for the, for the health insurance marketplace, we have, uh, we've been lucky enough to be able to, to have a lot of our outreach, which is really what brings people to us. Um, to, to sort of engage in the process um, that's that's run by a, a very you know by the same team um, it can it can sort of be coordinated and, and and you know thoughtful but once people arrive they really sort of enter a different universe for us and and we we um, we continue to do outreach to them but we we do it um, using different tools different channels that are more effective once people are in the process um, that uh, one of the things that we've been fortunate enough is, is we've invested a tremendous amount in our infrastructure and that allows consumers who start online to finish on the call center, um, uh, to f who start on the call center to finish online. Um, so, so we allow you know, that, that core challenge for the consumer, which is really getting through the application process. I don't know if any of you really enjoy uh, applying for health insurance. I think it's something that we all dread. Um, but we work very hard to make that as easy and accessible as possible. And one of the ways that w we know we can do that is by, by making it possible for people to help people through that process, which means that sometimes you can, you can sit down and do it yourself in one sitting. That's, that's of course, the ideal. Um, but even in, you know, in, in the, in, even in the outside world, that's not the standard. People have questions about plans. They want to talk to their friends. They want to make a really thoughtful decision, and that can be paralyzing. Uh, so what we've done is made it as, as easy as possible to um, come in and out of that process using whichever channel um, that 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 you, you know we have, and to remind people to finish it because a lot of people start, they get distracted, bringing them back in before their their key deadlines. Um, that that has been sort of our, our you know uh, the thing that has, has helped the most and that uh, it's all dependent on having an omnichannel experience and we've learned that because we've we've seen how these channels interplay so 
that's, that's I think, so those are the constituent steps that have helped us to, to get to an omnichannel experience and, and to use it as, as well as we could. Right, Tony, you want to talk about maybe some of the hurdles and uh, successes? The experience? Gladly. Um, I, it, Kate uh, mentioned that they had a futurist coming. I, I think I went to the wrong profession. That sounds like a really good job to have. It's pretty futurist. awesome. Uh, I wanted to actually, <laughs> actually go on a little sovereign to be a bit of a historian just because I, I was reading a, a history, a book that is about the history of DC the other day uh, called The Empire of Mud. Um, and uh, there's this little uh, nugget in there about in 1880, uh, the police inventory of the activities that the police had done over the course of the year. Uh, and I was so shocking to see what, what they counted. First of all, they counted anything, but first, and with precision. So there were 1,121 1, uh, trees and tree box repairs. There were 123 hydrants out of repair that they fixed, 67 filthy alleys, and uh, happily 195 uh, lost children repair, uh, returned to their parents. Um, so I sort of read this and I thought, you know, that was 311. 311 was going and, and talking to the police officer. And the police officer knew you, he remembered you. Um, and so there was this sort of like uh, analog version of, um, of the omni-channel experience. Now flash forward to 2016, um, and we've now got 35,000 employees in the District of Columbia, uh, 75 agencies. Um, and you know, one of the words that we talk a lot about uh, with Omnichannel is no wrong door. Uh, and, and I think we sort of need a uh, new metaphor around this because what has happened with this gr uh, you know, growth of the services that are provided and the people responsible for providing them is that we have thousands and thousands of doors and a lot of them are dead ends. Um, and uh, part of that is because each part of the government wants to provide services and wants to, you know, there's this sense that I want to have a direct uh, connection with my uh, client. Right, and so uh, I don't want that 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 interaction mediated by uh, you know a, a different call center or whatever else. And so what that means is uh, people are receiving information, but they're not sharing it with their with their peers across agencies. It also means that the services that they're providing to their clients are not necessarily the best because they're not plugged into what's going on across uh, across the spectrum of the services provided. Um, I think about uh, grass mowing, right? A very basic government service. Uh, in the District of Columbia right now, there are seven agencies responsible for mowing grass. Uh, there's one for the schools, there's another one for uh, the parks. There are two agencies that are responsible for mowing the median strips, depending on whether or not there's a rose bush on the median strip. Um, <laughs> So you can see how things quickly go awry here. Um, and actually, if you call 311 right now, this is one of the things that just still gets me, uh, is uh, it says, do not use this uh, service if you are reporting grass that is on private property, government, uh, government property, schools, or parks. And you're thinking, if, where am I supposed to be? Uh, what, what grass is still exists that's out there? And it turns out that it's the median strips. Uh, because that's the only agency uh, that has been plugged into the 311 uh, 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 process right now, right? So, yeah, hurdles. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I thought we said you weren't going to be so cynical. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I think that uh, for us in DC, I would say a couple things. One is um, uh, we have used technology as the great enabler. Um, and people are, everyone is absolutely right. This is not a technology answer. This is not about, um, you know, there's a lot of change management that goes into this and, and, and I'm going to talk about this. I'm sure we're going to talk more about it. But we have used technology as a great enabler. Uh, DC was at the forefront of Open 311, um, which uh, among the facets is having an open API that really lowers the barriers uh, for different agencies to interact with our omnichannel experience, right? So. We didn't go around and say, everybody has to now be on this new platform. We have a great platform, but uh, if you've got your old legacy system and you're not ready to move off of it, you can still plug into ours and we can still feed you information, right? So having that shareable platform was important. Having open data around this was very important uh, because it allowed us uh, to uh, have, the, have partners in the open data private community that could, uh, public community, that could help hold us accountable uh, we're holding ourselves accountable on the inside, but there's only so much you can do. Um, 
So having that integrated as part of it was also a really important piece. And then there was just this sort of, uh, I'll, I'll, we can do it, coin a new hashtag here, a war on doors, um, where we started looking around at all the different pamphlets that were going out around the city with different phone numbers that were on them. Oh, you've got this problem, call this phone number. If you've got that problem, call that phone number. Uh, and, and maybe this is uh, against the spirit of Omnichannel, where we said, look, we've got to cut out all these phone numbers. There's one phone number, it's 311. And that's how we can make sure that the information is getting shared across the way. Um, so those were a couple of the strategies that uh, we found successful for, for us. Awesome. So I think we might be running a little bit behind schedule. So I was going to, one of the other questions I was going to ask you all was some of your lessons learned that we could share with the audience. But I think you all shared some stuff I heard. Um, thinking about attracting people, but then also how are you going to continue to engage them when they're having issues. Um, war on doors, open data, and sharing with your private partners. How can you leverage them to improve that experience? Um, making sure that you have clear, a clear measure of success when you start out and where to invest your, your time and money, um, and thinking about the full customer journey. And a big part of this is a cultural shift. So um, I think since we are running a little bit behind, I did wanna we did wanna do a little bit of time for Q and A. If you guys are open for that with the audience, so I don't know who has mics, but does anyone have a question for our panelists? Thank you. Uh, you guys were talking a little bit about some obstacles and uh, Tony, especially you were talking about some small obstacles that are pretty daunting. Uh, one of the things as we look at customer experiences across the federal government we find that is an obstacle is legacy contracting where we have a number of old type contracts that really haven't been modernized, each one for an application or a particular purpose that has its own help desk, traditional call center, maybe some kind of an online experience, but they don't work together and the contracts themselves don't lend themselves to any kind of integration. So how in the federal, less so in the state, but some, and then less so in commercial, because it sounds like Amtrak really does have an omni-channel contact center experience that, that is possible, but how do we overcome the contracting challenge, especially in the federal space? That's a tough one. Yeah, it is a tough one. That's a whole whole nother conference. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys had no, any thoughts okay. on that. No, that's okay. No, but I think um, for from my experience, I have a hardware and software procurement background, and I I did that like ten years ago, and I have been seeing shifts, and I've had I've been seeing changes, and for us, our biggest thing is really making sure that the contracting area knows exactly what we want to do in advance. So normally we give them our requirements last minute, we got to get it out the door, it needs to be, it's all by the fiscal year and all that. So it's really reaching out to them in advance of everything, at least that's in my experience. I, I would, I guess I'd say two things. One is if, if you happen to be one of those legacy contractors, I would encourage you to, um, to innovate <laughs> um, and to, to actually to lead your clients. So, um, I, I think that, that, um, that that's some place where, I, you know, I, I've, I've done con consulting in the past and I think it's often very easy to try and sort of, um, you know, to keep the client happy by doing whatever it is that they're, they're saying. But I think that there's a, you know, I have definitely seen um, is sort of the government as a client be incredibly receptive to great new ideas and to things that sort of take us a, a big step forward. So I'd, I'd certainly encourage contractors to do that. I think the, the second thing I'd say is that um, I think that might be necessary to survive because I think as much as government is often slow at things, um, the, the innovation and, and sort of the, the, the combination of this consumer experience isn't really um, a, a plus anymore. It's becoming sort of vital to our ability to continue operating. Um, and I think that you know we already see our contractors working with each other to provide um, you know uh, levels of integration that we haven't had in the past. Um, and so I think it's I think it's the, certainly the direction that we're heading. How fast I can't tell you, but you know I think that, we're, that we consider a lot of this stuff to be incredibly important. Um, and moving in that direction is is going to be important to be a successful contractor in the future. From my standpoint, I mean, some of the stuff that I've been looking at recently is some of the more modular type contracts where you're, instead of getting all your requirements down up front, you look at kind of reshaping the unit of measure and you're buying 
um, agile sprints that give you a certain amount of user stories or, or points per sprint and you just start to buy firm fixed price sprints versus having to know all your requirements up front. And that gives you a little bit of flexibility as an agency to, you know, to be more, more modular and more agile. So you have your roadmap and the closer you get to new towards you know, the end of that roadmap, the more clear it becomes. But you want to be able to pivot if something isn't working. It's just my experience. But do we want to take another question? Anyone have any other questions? I saw one other. On. Morning. Um, questions um, kind of focused at you, Kate, but also for, for others as well. Um, I really liked the, the personalization that you mentioned. Uh, so how is Chris doing, you know? I'm curious to see how Chris is doing, but um, that, that perspective, did you um, kind of make Chris schizophrenic and give multiple personas, or how did you ad address that from that perspective, but personalizing it also, about this as well, um, different personas are coming to you. And then the second part of this was, and I didn't catch all of it, I really liked that kind of catchphrase that you had, the see me, recognize me, and so forth. Um, if you could repeat that, that would sure, be nice too. Sure. I can do that. That's the easy part. <laughs> See me, recognize me, know me, anticipate me. And that was something that our work group came up at a staff level. And it really resonated with people in the groups. It resonated outside of there. And I think it's actually going to be a theme going forward for some of our agency initiatives. So it'll be interesting to see where we go with that. Um, and in terms of personas, we had, we had a lot of different personas, and, and schizophrenia was definitely one of them. Um, but in, in all fairness, you have to think about, from the Social Security Administration standpoint, who our customers are, right? We have a variety of customers that a lot of people forget about. Um, and so we have to think about them on different levels. So Omnichannel, we talk about you know, the technology piece of it, but we also have a lot of folks that are disabled that are coming to us. So we have to make sure that everything is accessible as well. So we had, I think it was almost about 40 different types of Chris's. Um, one with a mustache, one lady with pearls. I mean, we had it down to even like a, a snapshot. And the reason we did that was because it really kind of hit home for folks when they could see like a picture of someone. And when we started talking about them and their user experience, um, you started really kind of understanding like, yeah, that, I, that is exactly what I want. You know, we had a high tech professional from New York. And, you know, if you talk about the future in 2020, this Chris is doing everything automated. And she doesn't care what information's out there about her. And she wants you to use that information on her because she wants a better experience going forward. And we have a lot of folks that are scared about data access. So one of the things when we, when we talk about customer experience, at least in our work group, we talked a lot about opting in and opting out, being able to share what you want to share versus what you, know, you have to share. So um, yeah, we had, we had tons of personas. We had different ways that people were interacting with us um, in different channels. Um, one of the things that recently came up when we were briefing with our hearings and appeals folks was that you know we talk about customer preferences. So I'd rather communicate over text because it's easier for me. Um, and one of the things we talked about was the fact that the hom homeless population, we send paper notices and a lot of times they don't know about their hearings. Um, and the notice goes and it never gets to them and then they get rescheduled and then eventually you know they ne maybe never get their hearing. A lot of them have cell phones, you know, and so it's interesting to think about it that as going forward as maybe that's a, a channel that's better to communicate mm -hmm. them with. Um, and so it, it's, it's important to look at these sorts of things and know that you have um, not just preferences, but it, it's a better way of doing business um, with people. And it's, it's the right way to go, and it's, it's where we should be going. That's cute. Mm -hmm. So I think we're coming up on, we're a little bit over our time. I don't know if we have time for one more question. I don't know who's in turn, <laughs> or if we should wrap it up. All right, one more question and then we'll wrap it up. I don't want to agree. Quick question for the whole panel. Um, we talked about omnichannel with across an agency, but a lot of agencies, you know, the mission aligns well with other agencies. Mm -hmm. CFPB with FTC, CMS and SSA. Can you talk a little bit about what you think are the best practices or 
procedures or doing that cross state procedure? Or is that not something right on the radar right now? I mean, I know at CFPB, they're definitely, there's a lot of kind of councils and coalitions where we work with partners, other regulators, very regularly, but it's around specific topics. Um, and I'm fairly new at CFPB, so I haven't gotten involved in a lot of the, the understanding of the logistics of how that all works. But maybe one of you can speak a little bit more to kind of that cross-agency collaboration. So healthcare.gov is, is a great example of this, but I'm not the right person to, to speak to it. I think um, you know the, the back end of our site works um, across, I think it's actually the, the, the largest sort of cross-agency sort of tech project that we have in the federal government, something something like that. Um, I, I can say it's relationships, right? It's, it's about every day, um, you know, talking to one another and, um, you know, being able to, to tackle the challenges together and to come to the table sort of as, as, as one group. Um, but I think for the, the kind of insight you're looking for, I can't help it. I've been thinking about that a lot also. And um, I now work for the Department of Labor, Veterans for Employment and Training Service. And so a lot of the federal agencies have um, a stake in the claim around veterans employment issues um, and federal programs and such. So I started digging to see who owns the subscription services to the online newsletters. I'm trying to get to the answer as well, actually, right now. And um, I came to find out that like, Small Business Administration has a newsletter that goes out to veterans for our office of small business, um, entrepreneur for veterans. Of course, VA, DOL, HUD, all of the services. We all use one subscription service delivery contractor. So I was thinking, isn't there a way that we could pool our resources to try to target that same customer base in order to let them opt into the kinds of information they want, rather than asking the customer or veterans and transitioning military service members to sign up for 800 different newsletters that kind of craft the same kind of information just from the different program areas. So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts around that, but I thought I'd just keep that on <laughs> question because I've been thinking about the same thing and how we can do this more efficiently government-wide rather than just I certainly think there's an opportunity for that kind of consolidation cross government for the same kind of services and targeting the same audience. Sorry, we got it. <laughs> I agree. I think um, in, in our, our little work group, we had the same concept of, of a higher level one government mm -hmm. thing where you know your preferences and what you want is all at, at one space. So we hear you here. <laughs> yeah, I would just say um, I think that conceptually that's, that's exactly right. And this is, I mean, at the city level, we've got uh, $100 million in job training. Uh, across the city, across 20 different agencies, and it's because of this no wrong door mentality meant that if you came to me and asked for job training, it was my responsibility to provide job training for you as opposed to look for where job training existed already in the city. Um, and so I think that, you know, when you have a mayor, you have a convening body, and there are convening bodies that have this sort of power in the federal level, um, but it really does push you to drop the acronyms um, and that's part of what the customer focus is, right? So it's not a this program or that program, it's you know, customer focused. Um, I think that tactically, uh, the you know, just return to the idea of the open API and saying we need to build our, our data systems in ways that allow people to tap into them. And you know, one of the uh, advantages that we had with DC uh, uh, 3111 open was um, I mentioned that it allows other agencies to, to create the, the um, to interact with it. It also allows uh, public or private entities to uh, submit tickets for us. So if you go on the app store on your iPhone, you can find you know four or five or six different DC 311 apps that DC does not run. Uh, and they all feed directly into our system. Um, and so that's the other sort of avenue to walk down here is not necessarily does do we need to have an interagency council that you know provides this opportunity uh, e equally across all of our agencies? But how do we open this up to let innovators outside of government uh, tap in and, and do that work for us? Because mm -hmm. we're not often that good at it. 
All right, well, I think we're at our time. Thank you to the panel, Tony, Josh, and Kate.